thanks so much, Anthony, and thank you to the Federal Society for, for hosting this debate at its annual faculty conference. I'm delighted to be here with two distinguished scholars to moderate this debate on the question, should the Electoral College be allocated? As you're all aware, the Constitution establishes an Electoral College for choosing the president. Meeting in their respective states, the electors vote by ballot for the president and vice president. Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federal 68 that the Electoral College would provide a practicable obstacle to cabal, intrigue, and corruption. He said that it would interpose capable men of discernment for deliberation over the selection of the president. Moreover, Hamilton thought the system best designed to prevent tumult and disorder. And so now as we head into the 2020 presidential election, debates about the Electoral College once again emerge over the desirability of our Constitution's method for selecting the president. So this debate is an important one about our republic and about, the, and about our constitutional form of government. It raises questions of principle. What are the values to be promoted in a democratic republic, in a federalist form of government? What precisely does the Constitution require electors of electors, and how far can states regulate what their electors do? How do concepts of voting rights, such as one man, one vote, impact these questions? In addition to the constitutional requirements and political principles, debates over the Electoral College are invariably also about practical concerns. What are the consequences of the Electoral College for political parties and campaign finance? For democratic accountability for corruption, for promoting the values of a constitutional republic. And so for our debate today, we have two eminent scholars who I will just briefly introduce. Debating in the affirmative, we have Lawrence Lessig, who is the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School. He's the author of many books and articles on government, intellectual property, and technology. His recent scholarship has focused on political and other forms of corruption. Professor Lessig ran for president in 2016, and he is the founder of Equal Citizens, a nonprofit with a seemingly simple mission to fix democracy by establishing truly equal citizenship. Um, arguing in favor of the Electoral College is Stephen Sachs, who is a professor of law at Duke Law School, where his research focuses on civil procedure, constitutional law, legal interpretation, and legal history. He is a regular blogger on the Vola Conspiracy, where he has written about the Electoral College. So our format today is simple. Professors Lessig and Sachs will each give an opening statement, which we will follow with some responses and discussion, and then open it up to your questions. And as excited as you may all be for this debate, we will not be putting the question to a popular vote. <laughs> so with that, Professor Lessig. Thank you so much, Judge Rao, and um, I'm grateful to the Federalist Society for entertaining this debate. I hope it's more a discussion. You know that um, in the middle of this presidential campaign, we've had many candidates talk about the question of the Electoral College. It's surprising that this issue has attracted more heat than light, one of the only issues in the presidential campaign where that might be said. Um, um, and, and so what I want to do is to move beyond to the kind of pyrotechnics of this populist question and focus on what I think is a really hard and important question we need to resolve. And I'm going to propose a solution that I don't believe anybody should oppose, at least on principle. So to get to that solution, I'm going to go through three steps. I'm going to talk about what it is, what the Electoral College is, not, beyond, not that you don't know what it is, but the critical elements that I think we have to keep in focus. Second then, what I think is wrong with it, given the characteristics that I've identified. And number three, how to fix it. So what is it? I think it's important to identify three critical structural elements that define the characteristics of the Electoral College. First, it is state-based, or at least states plus the District of Columbia. State-based in the sense that the elections are run in the states, and then the calculation is determined to determine who gets the Electoral College votes for that state. Number two, it is essentially winner-take-all 
in the states. Essentially, Maine and Nebraska have a partially winner-take-all system. But under a winner-take-all system, if you get just one vote more than everybody else in that election, you get all of the Electoral College votes in that state. And then number three, it is elector-driven. It's driven in the small sense that if you get 270 electors, you win the contest. But it's elector-driven in the sense that electors are people and they play a critically important role in deciding how those votes get cast. Now it's important when you think about these three elements to identify which of them is actually in the Constitution. Plainly, the state-based character of the Electoral College is in the Constitution, that's uh, its design. But winner-take-all is not in the Constitution. Winner-take-all developed um, uh, just after the Jacksonian period to be the default way in which electors would be allocated. There was a race to the bottom or a race to the top, depending on how you conceive of it, as states began to adopt winner-take-all. When it first started, Jefferson was completely outraged that this is the way electors would be allocated, but it was an innovation the states imposed on the structure the framers gave us. And number three, it really is elector-driven, in a sense that I want to describe very briefly because I'm a little bit conflicted on this question. Um, I'm the lead counsel in a, in a pair of cases that uh, the Supreme Court would decide whether to grant cert on, on Friday. Um, Chaplow and uh, Baca are two cases which address the question whether electors can be legally bound to vote the way the state wants them to vote. In Baca, the 10th Circuit wrote a 120-page opinion saying that no, they could not be bound. The Washington Supreme Court, an elected Supreme Court, uh, of course, concluded that yes, they could be bound. But I think it's obvious, I'm gonna even say here, in the Federalist Society, it should be obviously clear that electors cannot be bound by law. They are constitutionally free. They're constitutionally free because while the state has the power to appoint, the power to appoint does not carry with it the power to control the performance of the office to which you are appointed. Just ask any president when he or possibly someday she reflects on what Supreme Court justices they've appointed to. And number three, number two, the electors are, quote, electors. They are not agents or delegates or clerks. They are people who, like electors choosing who the representative or senator will be, exercise a constitutional discretion. The Supreme Court has said they exercise, they perform a federal function. If I had any courage, I would write a brief in the Supreme Court that was one page long. It would say, you've said they exercise a federal function. Can a state control some entity exercising a federal function? The answer is no, since the supremacy clause has been part of our design. Can a state penalize somebody for exercising a federal function in the way the state doesn't want them to exercise the federal function? The answer is no, not since McCulloch. So the point is electors are, quote, electors. Electors are in this sense free, and this is a critical element of the design the framers have given us that we must continue to reckon with today. Okay, so these three elements um, uh, can be judged independently, and here's how I judge them. So <clears throat> the fact that electors are constitutionally free is potentially catastrophic in the current climate of our democracy. If we imagine a scenario like 2000, uh, where uh, a couple votes determined who was the president. And leading up to that election, uh, it's been reported by Jesse Wegman um, that there was, um, or Jesse Wegman quoting articles from the Times, which have been denied, so I don't want to assert the truth of them, but I'm just going to report what was said. That leading up to that election, the George Bush campaign thought that they would win the popular vote but lose the Electoral College. And they were developing the argument at that time for trying to persuade electors to vote with the popular vote and against the election. My view is that if in fact that happened, if two electors switched their vote and switched the result of the election, given the current 
idea, uh, current context of our democracy, that would be an extremely difficult thing for the nation to accept. The second feature that it's winner take all, I think is really awful in a way that I want to describe. And the third feature, I'm going to get in trouble with my liberal friends, but the third feature that it is state based, <laughs> in my view is okay, or at least let's say it's good enough for government work. It's a design feature, not flaw. And I want to describe a solution that doesn't try to take that away. Okay, so the fact that this is constitutionally compelled means that if you wanted to fix the problem of elective freedom, it's going to require something like an amendment. But I want to start by focusing on the winner take all feature, because I think that's the core to understanding the problem with the current scheme. Okay, so what's wrong with winner take all? There's an obvious logic to winner take all, a political logic. And the political logic is that the only states that matter in a winner-take-all system are the so-called swing states. So most of America thinks that this is the country that elects our president, but of course it's this country that elects our president, the so-called swing states of America. In 2016, 95% of candidate appearances were in these 14 states, 99% of campaign spending. Now the thing about those swing states is that they are not small states. They are not rural states, they are not slave states, they are not especially intended states. They are swing states, meaning they're sufficiently purple to be states that could go either way. And the logic of campaigning is you only waste your money in places where the result could go either way. Now there are two important uh, conclusions that follow from this logic of swing states. Number one is to recognize no framer ever planned or intended or thought about a system that would be controlled by winner take all in these swing states. It wasn't what they were conceiving of when they designed the Electoral College. And number two, the swingers don't represent America. They're older, they're whiter, their industry is kind of late 19th century industry. There are seven and a half times the number of Americans working in solar energy as mine coal but you never hear about solar energy in a presidential election because those people live in Texas and in California. You hear about coal mining because coal miners are throughout the swing states. So what this means is the entity electing our president is not representative of America, which means in this sense, it's an unrepresentative uh, president. And the logic of that fact drives the candidates to appeal to swing state America over the rest of America. This fantastic book by Doug Kreiner and Andrew Reeves is an extraordinary empirical analysis of what happens in presidential politics and presidential administrations as they think about this dynamic. And what they show is that spending gets bent and policies get bent to benefit the swing states over the rest of the country who doesn't, who don't, that doesn't have the same power that the swing state do. In my view, this is the problem of the Electoral College. Not the one out of every nine presidents problem that has produced presidents who are not actually uh, chosen by the majority of voters. Not the one out of nine problem, the every election problem. Because in every election, the dynamics of this system drive the candidates to focus on an unrepresentative slice of America in order to get elected as the president of America. Okay, so how would you fix this? Well, if these are the elements that need to be fixed, the easiest fix is something called the National Popular Vote Compact. I'm sure everybody here is aware of what that does. That's a compact where when 270 electoral votes have agreed to this compact, they agree to pledge their electors to vote for the winner of the national popular vote. That compact would solve the winner-take-all problem because it would essentially be one person, one vote, and everybody would have an incentive to campaign wherever they could get a vote. It's not any more important in swing states versus any other place. I think it likely solves the, the electoral freedom problem because it would guarantee that the winner has at least 270 electoral votes, and then they get whatever other electoral votes they would get from states that are not part of the compact, creating enough of a buffer never to make it dangerous that one or two or three electors switching sides could actually affect the final result. But what the National Popular Vote Compact does is it surfaces the problem of a national election run through state-based 
administrations because this count for the national vote is being produced by 51 separate jurisdictions that have separate rules about who gets to vote or how they get to vote or what the techniques for voting are. So in my view, this system is constitutional. It's not clear in my view whether it is stable. We now see Colorado trying to withdraw from the compact. Um, but the compact as of right now, if it needs 270 votes, has 196 pledged and 113 in play. So it's a feasible, possible, what we could think of as the easiest fix. But what I want to do in the minus 10 seconds I've got left um, is to kind of think beyond this obvious hack to what we could call the best fix, or at least a politically possible fix that I think we all should be focused on. And the fix has two elements. The first is to say, we're going to keep the allocation of votes as it is. Every state gets the same number of votes as they have electors right now. So small states get a benefit over large states. But the second part, which is kind of hard to include in a tweet, but here it is. Um, this is a system that says the top two get the electoral votes allocated in a fractional proportional way at the state level. So that's intuition here is pretty clear. If the state of Montana votes 35.4% for the Democrat, which is what they did in 2016, then the Democrat would get 1.062 electoral votes and so on throughout the country. And the point is the dynamic that that would produce would mean that every state in a sense was in play and candidates would have an incentive to be campaigning anywhere there was a vote, every vote in the sense would count. So this solution you can imagine fixing in an amendment like this. The first part of that amendment would address the electoral freedom question. So it directs that electors would vote as state law directs. The second part would look like this. It's a little bit of a bear, but it's not hard when you break it on. So the first part says it's not going to affect the current election or any election within 24 months of the uh, amendment being considered. Second part says the electoral vote shall be divided proportionally between the two persons receiving the most votes within the state as determined by the method of tallying votes chosen by the state. So a state could choose ranked choice voting as a way to figure out who the top two people are, or it could just say the top two people. It's up to the state. And then finally, with, all, with fractions calculated to all significant dis, di, di, digits, so that means that essentially it's uh, as if it were tallying the individual votes. This plainly fixes the electoral freedom problem because it directs electors vote as state law directs. It solves practically the winner-take-all problem because it effectively makes every vote matter almost equally. Now, small states keep an advantage Yet it turns out that that's effectively politically neutral because small states are equal in a partisan sense between Republicans and Democrats. The bottom 10 states are five blue states and five red states. So even though the thumb is on a scale to benefit them, it's a benefit that doesn't have a partisan valence to it. And finally, it embraces the state-based model of the framing design because it allows each of these states to run their elections however they want, but they resolve it just at the question of the electoral votes as the electoral votes are concluded. Okay, so ergo, and it's not really appropriate for ergo, but every debate needs an ergo somewhere in it, so here it is, the ergo. Um, no one, I think, should oppose this kind of solution. This is the Lodge Gossett solution updated a little bit. No one, uh, because no one, um, uh, I think, can defend the intended, uh, the intent of the existing system. The existing system was intended by nobody. It has no purpose relative to any democratic principle that one can articulate. No one has defended its basis. And if we're going to have to fix it, if the electoral freedom problem creates a strong motive, if the Supreme Court declares that electors are free to actually address the problem and fix it, I get that's a big if, but if we need to fix it, then we should fix this too. We should create a representative president elected by all of America. And the question for my opponent is, who could be against that? So, <laughs> <that's right>. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Sachs. Uh, um, thank you very much to the organizers for having us, to uh, Professor Lessig and to Judge Rao. And thank you to all of you for sharing your lunchtime with us. Um, I, I do oppose that. Um, and I'm going to engage in the, the pyrotechnics that Professor Lessig warned about. I think the Electoral College is pretty good. 
Um, I recognize that's a stirring proclamation. I know the folks in the back from C-SPAN are glad they have cameras to record that someone at FedSoc thinks the Electoral College is pretty good. But I think it is good enough for government work, and it's good enough to be worth keeping. Now, in defending the Electoral College, I'm going to be defending the modern system we actually have. It is not, as Professor Lesig noted, what the framers had in mind, but it does follow the rules that the framers actually laid down. And following that framework, we have adopted a winner-take-all system of popular elections state by state. And I think the most important thing to remember about the Electoral College is that it is state by state. As uh, Martin Diamond stated uh, nearly 40 years ago, Presidential elections are already just as democratic as they can be. We already have one person, one vote in the states. Elections are freely and democratically contested in the states. Victory almost always goes democratically to the winner of the raw popular vote in the states. The label given to a direct popular election is something of a misnomer because the elections are already as directly popular as they can be in the states. Democracy is not the question for the Electoral College, federalism is. I see good reasons for keeping a partly federal, partly national way of picking the president in a partly federal, partly national republic the way we have, and I think those are good reasons for keeping the Electoral College. So first I'll explain why I think the Electoral College is better than a national popular vote, why I think it's better than the system Professor Lessig proposes, and why I think it really does preserve something meaningful about the kind of democracy we have. So start off with a national popular vote. Why not just say one person, one vote, whoever gets the most votes wins? I think there are at least four problems with that. A nationwide popular vote would bring with it a nationwide recount, nationwide fraud juries, nationwide election regulation, and the danger of nationwide splinter parties. Let me say a little bit more about each of those. So nationwide recount. We have had, over the course of our history, I think two elections in which the Electoral College vote was seriously disputed. Those are Hayes Tilden in 1876 and Bush Gore in 2000. Over that same period, we've had six elections where the national popular vote was within a 1% margin of victory. In 1880, Garfield beat Hancock by roughly 1,800 votes. That was a margin of 0.09%. Now, I think anyone who lived through the Florida 2000 experience cannot hear that without shuddering. Um, if you imagine what would happen today if we had an election under a nationwide popular vote decided by 1,800 votes across the entire country, you would have to have a recount in every polling place in America because every vote that is undercounted or indeed overcounted would affect somebody's total. That means it's just not very hard to pick up or unfortunately to suppress 2,000 votes across of all of America, and yet that's what we'd have to guard against. That brings us to the worries of nationwide fraud regulation. So one feature of the Electoral College is that it somewhat cauterizes fraud. It limits the incentive for fraud to places where fraud is harder to conceal. If you're in a deep blue state like Illinois or a deep red state like Mississippi, it just doesn't matter whether your presidential vote margin is you know, 20%, 25%, 30%. The electors are going to be the same either way. The place where it actually matters are the purple states where, by definition, people are more divided and the election could come out for either side. And those are the states where, by virtue of being purple, you're more likely to have officials from the other party in office able to look over your shoulder and able to cry foul if something goes wrong. Now, that's not an ironclad guarantee against fraud, but it does limit the incentive for fraud compared to a world where any county sheriff or county election official anywhere in America can manipulate a vote that's going to affect the whole country. Now, one way to prevent that kind of election fraud is election, nationwide election regulation. And I imagine you would have it in a system of a nationwide popular vote. But that can also choke off important variations across the states. So if you're going to have a nationwide popular vote, you need a nationwide definition of who can vote and what counts as a vote. Um, New Jersey gave the vote to women in 1776. There's no way they could have gotten away with that in a national popular vote system because the other states would have objected to their having more influence on the total. Today, if a state wants to drop the voting age to 16, which I think is a terrible idea, or if they want to drop the voting age to zero and let parents cast their kids' votes, which I think is a terrific idea, um, <laughs> then they can just go ahead and do it. They don't have to ask anyone's permission. 
Um, or if Maine wants to adopt ranked choice voting, as in fact they have for 2020. You vote for your first choice. If they lose, then your second choice. But you can't do that in a nationwide popular vote system because it breaks the calculation of what counts as a popular vote. Um, so if we had the National Popular Vote Compact, which I happen to think is not constitutional under the current regime, I'd be happy to say more in the Q&A, um, then they just wouldn't know how to handle Maine, or they wouldn't know how to handle a state that exp expands the franchise. A fourth danger is that of nationwide splinter parties. So the current system, by having winner-take-all elections in lots of different districts to add up to a single national office, tends to encourage big tent parties. It encourages a two-party system. I think that's good because it encourages parties that, in order to win everywhere, have to win somewhere. It encourages parties that will be in government, that have to govern and succeed at governing in order to win. By contrast, a nationwide popular vote says that if you can get an intense 33% of the electorate, that's fine. And you might win a six-way contest with a whole bunch of other parties, and you have no incentive to moderate. I think that would be very dangerous for the country as a whole. So how does this compare then? How does our current system compare? If it beats the national popular vote, what about Professor Lessig's proposal? Um, I think, unfortunately, the fractional vote might have a lot of the downsides of the national popular vote, but none of the upsides. It would have nationwide recounts because every, it would be you know, adjusted a little bit for, for turnout and for senators, but basically every vote anywhere would contribute to the total, and so you'd have to have a nationwide recount in close election. It would have all the nationwide fraud worries because, you know, Alabama and Illinois would still have an incentive to run up the store, even, even corruptly. You'd still have the splinter party worry, or if you limited it to top two, then you would have the problem of people's votes going to candidates they didn't necessarily support. So in Utah in 2016, 22% of the electorate voted for Evan McMullen. If you dropped him from the count and had to split the rest between Trump and Clinton, you would have a distorted picture of how people in Utah actually allocated their votes. And moreover, it would create an enormous small state bias. So as Professor Lessig noted, winner take all gives large states an advantage that somewhat counterbalances the small state advantage from getting two senators each. If every state had fractional voting, you can get a lot more fractional votes with fewer voters by campaigning in small states. And exactly the kind of uh, incentive for governance and subsidy and everything else that he currently sees with swing states would still exist just focused on small states instead. It would shift the bias in the system, and it wouldn't actually correct for it. But still, can we defend the nationwide, the, the nationwide electoral colleges that currently exist? I think the answer is yes. The nationwide system that we currently have is, in fact, democratic. It does treat people's votes equally. It treats them equally in the states. So you might say, how can that be true? If I'm a New Hampshire voter, my vote just counts for more than a Texas voter, especially than a Texas Democrat who might as well stay home. But if you look at how other countries handle elections, and indeed how we handle elections in our own House of Representatives, you see how that's not true. I live in Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Chapel Hill is a safe democratic district. It's going to be a safe democratic district pretty much any way you draw fair lines. Does that mean that if I go to the poll and vote for the GOP that my vote doesn't count? Not at all. Uh, any more than if my neighbor goes to the polls and votes Democratic. If both of us stayed home, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't affect who actually controls the House of Representatives. We both had an equal chance to affect the outcome in our little election, even though our little election is just part of what happens in the country as a whole. The same is true for blue and red states. If a Texas Democrat stays home or a Chapel Hill Republican stays home, it's exactly the same because their votes affect what the total is going to be in their election. We don't say that the House of Representatives is illegitimate for using election districts any more than we should say that the presidency is illegitimate for using the Electoral College, or indeed that other countries are illegitimate. So if you look at Canada, Justin Trudeau won a majority of parliamentary seats with less than the plurality of popular votes, which went to the other party, but we don't say he's an illegitimate prime minister. They didn't have one big popular election. They had lots of little elections. Likewise, in the UK, um, people joke that the, the reason Brexit is taking so long is because it won the popular vote and lost the Electoral College. Uh, in the same way, you couldn't get a law passed until you had a majority of parliamentary seats willing to endorse it. That's a standard way of governments doing business, and it's not something that we should see as deeply illegitimate or deeply wrongheaded with respect to America either. 
So why do we have these districts? Well, the answer is that it allows for more representative government. It allows for greater influence by smaller interests over the whole. If you think about a city council election, we all see how smaller interests can sometimes have voice if you divide it up into districts than if you had just an at-large election where you know, everybody voted and the smaller interest lost every time. Or when you're thinking about how diplomats put together you know, a power sharing arrangement for Bosnia. They don't just say, well, here's the map of Bosnia. Everyone who lives here gets one vote. Good luck. Um, instead, they have various kinds of checks and balances to make sure that no one interest overwhelms the others. And 51% of the vote doesn't turn into 100% of the power. Now, thankfully, the United States is not Bosnia. Um, but we do have a very large and a very diverse republic that's divided into partly self-governing communities that get to do on some topics what they want to without having to ask anyone else's permission. And in the same way, the Electoral College requires you to win those partly self-governing communities. It uses a decathlon rather than a sprint to determine who's the best athlete. Can the president win in a lot of different kind of contests among different self-governing communities. I think that really is an advantage there because it causes the national government to be a little bit more careful about stepping on state toes. People have to think, how will this policy play in Pennsylvania? How will it play in Colorado? And at the same time, individuals have more influence. You get to call your congressman or call your senator in a way that just saying, call the Republican National Committee wouldn't really help you. Having districts helps individual people translate their preferences into government policy. Now, given all of this, why should we allow, though, people from Wyoming or people from New Hampshire to have more influence? And the answer is that's already how the system works. If you look at the House and you look at the Senate, if you want to pass a law, you have to have not only people representing more than half the population behind you, but also people representing more than half the states. That's the way our partly federal, partly national system works. And the Electoral College is just a reflection of that. It's just a compromise between the federal and national aspects of our system. Not everything that states want to do is necessarily good. We've seen a lot of changes in state power over the last century, some of them for extremely good reasons, but not all for good reasons. And if you think that there's anything to federalism, if you think that especially federalism should be protected by political safeguards, then you need some political safeguards. And the Electoral College happens to be one of them. The Electoral College might not be what any of us would come up with right now sitting down at a drawing board, or a PowerPoint presentation. But the same is true about you know, the state of New Jersey. You know, who, who ordered that? Uh, no one would sit down and draw the lines that our 50 states happen to have. They're just what we've inherited and what we happen to work with. And there has to be a heavy burden of proof against a reform that would scrap the system we have in favor of one where the problems haven't been fully thought of yet. And I think that the uh, Professor Lesick's proposal or the nationwide popular vote proposal don't actually overcome that burden of proof. In our system, if you want to become president, you have to convince a number of states to back you. I think that that works in the system that's partly federal, partly national. I think that it's good enough. And I think good enough is what we should really be after. Thank you. <laughs> good enough. That's, that's what we need. OK. Um, so Professor Lesk, if you want to take a couple minutes to respond. Yeah, so uh, um, that's incredibly helpful because it's important to distinguish between the things we are disagreeing about and the things that we have no disagreement about at all. I'm not advancing the argument in favor of national popular vote. I should, people would say, but that's not my purpose here. My purpose is instead to advance a modified version of the current electoral college which contrary to what you're suggesting, retains all of the things you've identified as the values of the Electoral College. What I said, and you know, we're all in this period of grading exams and learning how just how bad we are at explaining things to our students. Um, <laughs> so I accept full responsibility if this was not clear. But, um, but what, what I said is that it's proportional allocation at the state level. So you decide how to allocate at the state level, but there is a firewall between Pennsylvania and Ohio because each of those states is deciding independently how they're going to allocate their votes based on what the top two vote getters would be. You, you would properly identify the problem where, for example, in Utah, when you, have, um, a, when you had a third party candidate who, if that third party candidate was substantial, could affect the results substantially. That's why states like Maine 
have experimented with ranked choice voting, which would eliminate that, uh, in many cases, that spoiler effect. And, and I encourage, I would encourage, as you are, that kind of state-based um, uh, uh, innovation. Um, the core point that I'm making, though, is that the current system of federalism-based electoral college uh, determination um, fundamentally biases the system in a way that nobody ever expected or wanted or argued for. Swing states are a, a minority of the United States. The consequence of this system is that presidents care about the minority of the United States, not about every part of the country. So Republicans in California just do not matter. You, you said everybody will think about how will it play well, they only think about how will it play in 14 states. In this election, only in five states are they thinking about how it will play. So all I'm saying is let's have a federalist-based system that gives them an incentive to think about how will it play everywhere. Because everywhere would matter if you had this proportional allocation at a fractional level of the Electoral College vote. And, and that allocation is not just better democratically in the sense that it would give more in the country a voice in choosing who the president is, it's also uh, better from an equal protection perspective. Um, you said there's nothing not democratic about the structure of the system. In fact, the Supreme Court has expressly said that a winner-take-all system like this, which basically resolves the um, allocation of delegates at an interim level, case of Gray versus Sanders, 1963, footnote 12, if you didn't get to footnote 12 in that case, um, the court uh, expressly said that, the purpose, that that system, which is basically electoral college at the state level, um, uh, is a system for counting the votes um, of the minority for the purpose of discarding those votes, and that that was independently a violation in their conception of what equality, one person, one vote, vote would require. This alternative would eliminate that problem. Because what this would do is give everybody um, more power relative to the current system, which gives power to just those 14 states. So then in the end, the only argument that we're going to have on the facts, it seems to me, is your claim that my alternative would bias in favor of the small states, um, whereas the current alternative biases in favor of the big states. Now, I can tell you that many on the right would be surprised, because many on the right think that the current system biases in favor of the small states. I'm glad we're in agreement that that's not, in fact, what happens. But I, I just deny the empirical claim. There's no basis for expecting that the relatively small proportion of votes that are offered by the small states would create a systematic advantage for those small states relative to other states, um, especially when you consider the cost of campaigning in different states and the concentration and the opportunity of campaign. It might be. But there's no reason to believe it would be. So when you talk about burdens of proof, we have a system that right now creates a substantial burden on the opportunity of a majority of Americans to have an influence on the election of the president. Why isn't that burden enough on my side um, for saying, let's tinker and figure out something that could be better? Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry, I appreciate that. And I, I too apologize if I've been unclear. Um, if, if there were a hat from which we picked out the names of swing states and safe states and just declared that only the swing states could ever have influence on the presidential election, I would entirely agree with you. I think that's a bad system, and it would bias the system in all the ways that you describe and that we shouldn't do it. But there is no hat. Um, the reason why a state is a swing state is because the people there actually disagree about who should be president. And the reason why a state is not a swing state and it's a safe state for one side or the other is that everyone there has already had their voice heard in saying, we think the Democrat or we think the Republican ought to win. Um, so, and states change their composition. You know, Missouri used to be a swing state, now it isn't. North Carolina used to not be a swing state, now it is. Um, states move around, and the very fact that they move around limits the possibility of any long-term political bias in favor of some interests over others. By contrast, in a world of fractional popular voting, you would have a substantial interest in favor of small states. So I, I did this calculation not knowing that it would be, it would be fractional, but on the proposal to just have proportional voting, but sort of integer voting by electoral vote, 
you would need to convince an extra 266,000 voters to get an extra vote in 2016 in New York. You would have to convince an extra 82,000 voters, or one third as many, to get an extra electoral vote in Wyoming because turnout was different, they just don't show up as much, and so you can get more fractional votes by going to the small states than you can to the large states. So my claim is not that the large states are the ones ruling the roost of the Electoral College. My claim is just their advantage in winner take all, and the small states' advantage in having extra senators sort of counterbalances each other. I'm not saying it comes to an exactly even balance. It's a clutch, it's a compromise. It sort of winds up somewhere in the middle that's probably good enough. And in my view, the argument for shifting to a system that, yes, would be state-based in terms of proportions, but would nonetheless have the impact that any voter manipulation anywhere affects the total everywhere, because we're calculating this out to like eight significant figures. You know, we're going to have a lot of digits uh, behind the one, and so we're going to have influence from all states all over, I think is actually worse for national election administration and is not obviously more representative of the people as a whole. So if you look over the course of American history, the biggest discrepancy we've ever had between the popular vote and the Electoral College was Hayes-Tilden, where Tilden reportedly got 3% more than Hayes. Now, whether he actually got 3% more is not totally clear. There was a lot of election rigging on both sides, especially in the South voting for Tilden. But, you know, 3% is not that much. It's not like we're talking about you know, tiny minorities of the people ruling over the rest of us. And I think for that much of a discrepancy between how the popular vote might come out and where the electoral vote would go, I think, to be honest, it's just not worth trying to uh, change. I think that having a system that allows states to choose by state is preferable to a system that tries to spread out the election across the entire country on a polling place by polling place manner. Yeah, so really clear um, the uh, point you're making that I want to make sure we're distinguishing one part. So you say the states that are swing states are states where it's not yet resolved who would win that state. And that's why it's important to fight the contest in those states. And so in that sense, you're right. It seems to be an appropriate place to be conducting presidential elections. But the problem is the demographics of those people are substantially different from the demographics of the nation as a whole. Not just their color or their, uh, um, or their uh, age, which is substantially different, but also the kind of industry that they are industry interested in. So if the, if the president is supposed to be a national officer, that's why that book by Reeves and Kreiner is called The Particularistic President. You're supposed to be a national officer thinking about the interests of the nation as a whole. This is a system that picks a minority of states who have a particular but not national interest in what the future of the United States would look at. So it's a pretty bad selection of this subset of the United States to select who the president uh, would be. Now, you, you described it as a, quote, compromise, but that's my point. There's no compromise. Nobody ever made a deal about this. If the framers made a deal about this, I'd be eager to hear their reasoning, but no deal was made. It's a kind of accidental consequence of a series of independent decisions that got us into what is an, a, a, a suboptimal uh, 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 uh. A place. Um, and then finally, I would agree with you. The whole reason I'm talking about fractional votes is that it eliminates this effect that you identify of the small number of uh, votes in small states relative to big states to be able to swing in electoral college votes. It eliminates it not completely because of the design of the thumb on the scale that gives Wyoming three electoral college votes when um, uh, that's 66 times uh, as powerful as what uh, um, uh, other states might have. Um, but it does a little bit. And to the extent we want to respect a framer's choice, there it is, a choice to give smaller states slightly more influence in the ultimate choice of the president than bigger states. And that's what this solution would do. So I, I take the point that the swing states don't necessarily reflect the country as a whole. But again, the swing states are not predetermined. The swing states just end up swing states because everyone else has already voted, and those are the places that we're unsure. So if the industries are different, if swing states have a lot of coal, it's only because that's where people are actually divided on the presidential election. And so it's true that you're going to have you know, the money and the attention go to the, go to the undecided voter. Um, 
Often you might think that the undecided voter is not the person you want to be deciding the presidential election. Um, but that's, you know, in any election, that's how it's going to be. People are going to focus on the votes that are not yet won by either side. And so the question is, do we want a system which functions on a state-by-state -state level that has the state's interest as states taken strongly into account? Or do we want a system that sort of mushes out the influence of states by turning it into very small fractions here and there. And I think that the, the administration arguments against a fractional vote are strong enough to suggest that the state-by-state -state system that we've just sort of lucked into, that was not a product of design, it is a product of evolution and sort of a kludge between a lot of different interests polling in a lot of different ways, I think is a pretty good one. Okay, but let's be clear. One, it's not the case that under both systems we're only focused on the undecided votes because in the system I'm describing, we'd have a reason to turn out the people who are strongly committed one way or the other. Right now, people in California, like people in Texas, don't we know, we can show they suppress the voting turnout because it doesn't really matter how they're gonna vote, and they know that. But if in fact it did matter, then we'd be working to not only persuade somebody to vote Republican who's voting Democrat or Democrat voting Republican, we'd also be eager to turn out people we know already support the candidate because that, that, that turnout would actually matter there. And those people would feel empowered because the system would be counting them just like it would be counting somebody from Pennsylvania. So I think it really depends on what you think it means for the system to already be counting them. The system is counting them. They just don't exceed the number of people who disagree with them in their state. And that's the, that's the setup you have in any district election when I'm voting for Congress in my district. Yeah, that's you know? Gray versus Sanders. They're counting them for the purpose of discarding their vote. That's why they're counting them. So I th think this is probably a good time to move to some questions. I see we have some interest. Uh, so, Mr. Calabresi? Uh, oh, just please wait for the microphone. Yes. My questions are mostly for Professor Lessig. Uh, first of all, um, the United States is blessed by the fact that we are a 50-state federation. We're chopped up into a lot of different pieces. If we were a four-state federation of the Northeast, the South, the Midwest, and the West, I think that either the Northeast or the South would secede from that federation in fairly short order. So I think the block of states that you identify as purple states and that are undecided are the key states that keep the United States together and that prevent secession. And I regard secession as a total failure of the American constitutional and national project. Second, um, one of the great advantages of, of the Electoral College is that it always produces a winner on election night. You always know by midnight or two in the morning who's won in the Electoral College. With a national popular vote, the vote count could drag on for months, as the Florida vote count did in the year 2000. You know, one county would discover 200 more votes for Al Gore, another county would discover 360 for George W. Bush, another county would come, discover 570 for Al Gore, and back and forth it would go. We could go from election day to inauguration day without really knowing who won the popular vote because partisan election officials in the 50 states would find votes uh, that we might not otherwise find. The Electoral College at least produces a winner nationwide, and that's a hugely valuable thing. Um, and then finally, you talk about the compact among the states and uh, the agreement of the states if 270 electoral votes are allocated to award them to the winner of the popular mandate. Let me read to you from Article 1, Section 10. No state shall uh, with that, enter into any agreement or compact with another state. That compact clause forbids compacts among the states, agreements among the states. The interstate compact to award electoral votes to the national popular vote winner is clearly an agreement or compact among the states. It has to be approved by Congress in order for it to go into effect and for in order for it to go into law. Um, so, Stephen, um, it's an extraordinary thing if it just so happens, as I think the other Stephen was um, emphasizing, that the swing states are the glue that keeps the nation together. Otherwise, we would have secession. That would be an amazing thing that, if in fact, this string produce that result. I don't, I'd love to understand the theory about why that would be true. 
Um, but again, I'd have to say, I, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to insist that that benefit needs to be justified against the cost, which is to tell New York Republicans or California Republicans or Texas Democrats that their views are not going to matter to the president as the president is trying to figure out how to win an election. Um, so you're sacrificing something to gain something. I'm skeptical you're gaining what you're describing, but even if you were, there, there still is uh, an important argument <laughs> left unsaid. Um, you're right about the speed which is produced by winner take all relative to what I'm talking about. But the amendment that I'm describing says that the winner is determined as the states determine. The amendment explicitly gives the states the procedure. And the procedure could include procedures for cutting off or deciding at a particular time what the allocation will be based on the votes that have been cast. Um, so I, I don't particularly feel the urgent need to feed the media's news cycle of being able to decide by 9.07 exactly who the president is. I think a couple days or a couple weeks wouldn't be such a terrible thing in exchange for giving more people an opportunity to participate in the actual selection of our president. I mean, I think that's the ultimate value that we ought to be pushing for. And finally, as to the compact clause, way above my pay grade, that's why I'm not defending or trying to engage in the compact, I will say that there are, there's a substantial body of literature, especially from um, people on the right, who suggest that the compact clause is dividing between certain things that require an, a, a concession of Congress, and this is not one of them because of uh, pre-existing state uh, authority, versus those that would require concession of Congress. And if it requires a concession of Congress by, uh, in order to be uh, a valid, then Congress should enact it. I mean, if in fact the states want it, Congress can enact it. But I know that there's a substantial dispute about whether every one of these types of agreements needs the uh, consent of Congress, and there's a strong argument that it doesn't. So if I could speak to two points there. Um, first on the compact clause. Um, the Supreme Court has, in my view, under-enforced the compact clause. Um, but I think that even on its under-enforced version of the compact clause, this still is a compact that would require uh, congressional approval. And that's for two reasons. First, unlike just a simple reciprocity rule where you know, we recognize the bar membership from anybody who recognizes our bar membership, um, it actually requires a meeting of the minds. You have to all agree at the same time for the statute to have any effect whatsoever. Not until you've got 270 uh, electoral votes worth of states agreeing does it click and the compact comes into effect. And that's one of the indicia of having a compact. The second thing is that it actually restricts a state's ability to withdraw. So the National Popular Vote Compact says you can't withdraw from this agreement within six months of a presidential election. Um, that is not the case for a bar recipro reciprocity rule. It requires an actual governing instrument that binds the state's abilities to change their own law. That is the definition of a compact that's over and above ordinary legislation by an individual state. And then third, the Supreme Court has identified as a reason to, in, to require congressional consent that it impinges on the federal structure of our union or aggregates the power of the member states. And I think that's classically the case with the National Popular Vote Compact. The states with 270 electoral votes decide among themselves who's going to win the presidential election. And whatever the other states do is pretty much irrelevant. Um, that, to me, is what uh, impacting the federal structure and augmenting the power of those states means. If, you know, in the days before the 17th Amendment, if half the states agreed on which slate of senators they were all going to appoint, that would obviously give them control of the Senate exclusively of everyone else. That would obviously be the kind of thing the Compact Clause was there to prevent. And I think the same is true of the National Popular Vote Compact. Uh, finally, on one point, responding yeah. to Professor Lessig, and I think this might help articulate some of our disagreement. It really depends on what you see as the polity that's voting for the president. If you see the polity as the entire you know, citizen over 18 population of the United States, then it makes sense to say that yes, it is unfair for a California Republican or a Texas Democrat to have sort of no impact on the outcome. If you see the polity as a composite of 50 smaller polities, or 51 with DC, each of which is making its own decision about which way to go, then the answer is not that you have no voice. The answer is just you've been outvoted. The people in your election went the other way. You had as much voice as anyone else did, and they disagreed with you. 
Um, and I think there are perfectly good reasons for seeing our country as an assemblage of a whole lot of states for a whole lot of national purposes. The federal constitution binds the states in all sorts of ways. That's a very good thing. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that when picking the president is anti-democratic that we would vote by states. Can I just be, I think, let's oh, just be we, clear about one thing there. Again, the point in gray is it's not okay that in the interim step along the way to choosing an officer, you throw away votes because you happen not to have won that interim step. So that's precisely the conclusion of gray, contrary to that. And one man's modus ponens is another's reductio. I mean, maybe, maybe Gray is wrong precisely for that reason. If we were to admit Canada as the 51st state, as indeed the, the Articles of Confederation invited them to join, um, but if we were to invite Canada tomorrow as the 51st state, they're big, you know, they're the second largest country in the world. It would make sense that they would have some sort of internal districting system, and maybe our concept of equal protection as the court has applied it is mistaken in that way. Okay, let's take a, another question over here. Um, I have a question about the way the president sees himself in the presidential mandate, as they call it. Um, and that, given that both President Obama and President Trump have both used Twitter, and with each coming president, uh, we seem to have an arms race in terms of the rhetorical presidency ratcheting up, trying to connect with the people in a closer way. Um, what do you think the effect of having a president seeing himself as even closer to the people, as the sole representative of the people's will, what do you think would happen to that? Under the modification I'm talking about? Sure. Um, that's a great question. I guess, you know, I start with a skepticism about this trend, the belief that this trend is um, not to be encouraged. Um, not so much because I have, I'm skeptical about the capacity of people to understand these issues or reckon with these issues, but I am skeptical about the capacity to understand them and reckon them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so I, I think, in fact, we need to figure out structural breaks, pauses, ways to sit and reflect more carefully, and the Twitter-based presidency is obviously resisting that. But to the extent it does have an effect, I think it has an effect by including a wider range of Americans in that conversation, right? You know, would the, what would the Republican Party be like if Republicans from California and New York mattered more than just the money that they give to the Republican Party? Like, what would that look like? I mean, would it be a different mix of interests that I think would direct uh, how the party would, if, would, would behave? And the same thing with Democrats from Kentucky, um, you know, or Democrats, there are some I hear, um, or Democrats um, from Texas, um, who would have a more significant role in what the Democratic Party would think of. And, I, and again, it seems to me that's the presumptive baseline of what a representative system should try to do, give equal representation to everyone who's a citizen within the republic. So I think your question is getting at something important, which is, do we have the vision of the presidency as sort of the tribune of the people translating the popular will into law, or do we have the vision of the presidency as sort of a, a chief magistrate you know, overseeing a very complicated executive branch, but in some sense a functionary within that? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, that, that it would have too much practical difference. In the, I, I do think a national popular vote would increase the sense of mandate, um, but not so much. I mean, the president seems to be claiming the mandate even without a popular victory. So I don't know. I don't know whether you'd, you'd really see differences there. Um, you know, during the convention, for a lot of it, they thought of even more indirect means of selecting the president, like by having Congress uh, appoint the president. I don't know whether that would be a good idea. People seem relatively attached to the idea of popular elections that affect the presidency. Um, but I think that um, it would it would have some effect, but maybe not a first order effect on if we switched from the current system to Professor Lessig's to a nationwide popular vote. Question here in the front. Um, you identify, if I got this on, uh, you identify uh, coal over solar, but I wonder if you can name some other policies that you think have been distorted by the power of swing votes, just mm -hmm. concretely. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I would recommend the book, which has a ton of examples. For example, 
around trade policy. So every president, Republican or Democrat, finds it really tempting to help the steel industry in Pennsylvania with go no good reason um, coming up to an election cycle. In this current administration, I think one really clear example of that was after Trump um, became president, uh, the offshore drilling ban was lifted. Um, um, states like California and New Jersey were very upset about that. Um, states like Florida were also excited about that. Florida got an exemption from that almost immediately, and California and New Jersey are basically lost. Um, now, what's the difference between California, New Jersey, and Florida? It's Florida's essential role in a presidential election. So uh, if, if, if I didn't have the data that Kreiner and Rees is providing, this would be pure speculation. But I think we have good reason to believe, seeing the way presidential campaigns function and how spending gets directed, that there is an effect. And if there is an effect, then the question seems to me is, what good reason is there to construct a system that produces the distortion when we could have a different system that would eliminate it? I think the question we really need to ask is magnitude. You know, how large is the effect and how persistent is the effect? So the baseline is, you know, Menker also, and we're going to have concentrated interests getting their way. We're going to have sugar subsidies for Florida, and ethanol subsidies for Iowa, and whoever knows what other kind of subsidies for everybody else. And we're going to have that because of the way the Senate is set up and the way the House is set up. And the question is, how much more of it do we have because of the way the Electoral College is set up? And how long term is it? So given that states filter in and out of swing state pro uh, status, is that a first order problem with the, with the way of selecting the president, or is it a secondary problem? Um, I, I have not yet uh, reviewed their book, though it sounds very interesting. Um, and, and I'd be curious as to, as to the size of those effects and whether they really are large enough to make us say, you know what, we'd better revise the method of selecting. But I, but I think that's a great perspective, because I think both Olson and Madison, just to pick a figure here on the stage, <laughs> Um, would imagine sure. that concentrating the influence in these 14 states, or in this current cycle, five states, um, produces a greater risk of this kind of capture and special interest-driven uh, agenda, as opposed to diffusing the interest across the whole of the country, which would produce the dynamic that would allow us to fight that special interest yeah. more effectively. If I could take the moderator's program, I actually I have a question. Um, it seems in a lot of this debate and the back and forth that you've been having, there is um, a conflating of the, the various principles that you think are served by the existing Electoral College or by your proposal and the empirical consequences of choosing that. And I guess I'm wondering, and you know, there seems to be a lot of disagreement about the empirics, right? What would happen by making such a change? But I'm wondering how important you think the underlying principle is behind each of your proposals. Well, I, I, that's a great clarification, because I, I do, and I should insist more strongly, I do think that the principle is the number one motivation here. Mm -hmm. We have a representative democracy. You know, conservatives often say, we don't have a democracy. You're right. Framers meant a republic. By a republic, they meant a representative democracy. It's kind of built into the title, a representative democracy ought to be representative. And that means you should not be structuring the rules to make some people less represented than other people. Um, um, now, I, nobody thinks that we've intentionally structured it like that. It's kind of accidentally walked back our way into that place. But the principle that says that when we have a presidential election, everybody should feel equally empowered to participate in the election of the president of the United States seems to be fundamental. And then the empirics uh, bolster this point. We know that swing states have higher turnout than non-swing states. So we know that the participation in the political process is affected by this rule. What justification is there to have a rule that's su effectively suppressing participation in politics? Because obviously, the participation matters more than for the president. It would matter for other offices as well. And then the empirics around what happens in spending um, uh, or in regulation is also significant, as again, reinforcing the argument that we ought to um, go sustain the fundamental principle of representative equality. So I, I think for me, the, the principles are part of the empirics in the following sense. Um, when you say something like, the Electoral College preserves a state interest in choosing the presidency, well, presumably that matters because what happens is actually different. You know, the Electoral College was made for man, not man for the Electoral College. And so if you're going to have um, a system that tries to protect state interests, when you want to, does it actually succeed in that, in that uh, uh, effort. Do you um, think that is the principle behind that, protecting state interests? I, I, I think that is at least part of the principle. I think that's the reason why electors were designed to be 
picked by states and not by, I mean, they didn't have many other mechanisms available in 1787, but they could have come up with one, and one reason that they didn't was because they wanted the states to be able to speak in some sense as states. It's the state legislatures that decide on the method of appointment of the electors. Um, those were the units of government they had. And again, if you were assembling the EU today, you would probably want a substantial amount of power to rest with the member states in shaping what the, the central government would look like. Um, and you know, th that means for me that, that it's not obvious that the principle of equal representation, which I do recognize and which I do think has some value, necessarily trumps the other worries that would be created by a move to a nationwide system or to a fractional vote system. I'm oh, sorry, Brad, Chris has that. <clears throat> I want to raise a couple points. Many years ago, I published an article called uh, Real and Imagined Problems in Campaign Finance Reform. And, and I feel a little bit today like it's real and imagined problems in the Electoral College. Uh, the real problems are the recount problem that Steve mentioned, which we saw in 2000. Uh, and we could imagine in several other elections, there are many which would have been close enough, for example, to fall within mandatory state recount the laws, if we were to use those laws and impose them nationally. A real problem is fraud, which we saw in 1876 and 1888. In each of those cases, it's quite probable that the nominal winner of the aggregated popular vote actually would not have won in a fair election. But the benefits of the fraud were isolated to the states where that fraud occurred. The imaginary problems are the faithless electors. Uh, there's never been a faithless elector that has decided a presidential election, even under tremendous pressure in 1876, in 2000, and 2016. This is just not something that happens. Virtually no electors are, in fact, uh, faithless to begin with. And when they are, it's when it doesn't matter, which is precisely why they feel some leeway to be faithless. Another imagined problem, I think, is this question of political power. Uh, for example, Larry started with the coal thing. So the, thanks to the wonders of the internet, we can sit here and do this stuff right now. The, the top 10 coal producing states in the United States are Wyoming, West Virginia, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Montana, Texas, Indiana, North Dakota, and Colorado. Only two of those could even remotely be called swing states, I think, in, in any way. The top 10 clean energy job states are Texas, Illinois, Colorado, and Indiana. Notice that those four states are on both lists, um, followed by California, Michigan, Iowa, Florida, Washington, and New York. So four of those states could be on the swing state list. There's no reason if we just want to take that quick eyeball to think that the coal industry is somehow getting favored uh, uh, policy because it consists of swing states. And I think I have seen the, you know, and looked at the evidence on this in great detail. I mean, one example, and you choose a bad example, that, that's okay, that sometimes happens, right? But I think there's very little evidence of that, that, that it's a real problem as opposed to a, a popular vote, more popular vote oriented solution in which you're pandering straight to the electorate uh, nationwide to try to gin up uh, popular votes. So uh, I, I don't want to go on too long and I don't really have a, a, a voice raising inflective question to end this with. I'll just ask you to comment on those thoughts and whether in fact the problems uh, suggested really are uh, the problems we should be worried about. Well, well I will observe that I think it's 1832, but um, in fact, faithless electors um, uh, refused to support the uh, vice presidential candidate, throwing it into the Senate, and then the Senate had to vote to overcome uh, the decision of the faithless electors. Um, and I will say that you've seen both Democrats and Republicans recently advance a principle that faithless electors have a faith-driven uh, reason to deviate from their pledge um, in 2016 and in 2000. So it might, it's of course so, so far hypothetical, and my whole point is that's good that it's just been hypothetical so far, because I'm fearful that when the argument becomes even stronger, which after a 120 page opinion by Judge McHugh in the 10th Circuit, um, it seems that the argument is stronger, um, uh, this is a problem that uh, could manifest itself more clearly. As to the you know, empirics, yes, the internet's great. It's also terrible because, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you can dislodge the claims of a substantial empirical work um, through a simple list of two states, uh, two uh, uh, subject of states. So Kreiner and Reeves' point is not about, you know, uh, coal. Their, their point is a substantial consideration of a wide range of policies, including trade policy and uh, industrial policy, uh, and farm policy 
which um, they, the evidence su supports the claim that that policy is being driven by this dynamic precisely. So you might, I think it's a fair thing to say, how significant is it? That's fine. But it's not a made up problem. It's certainly real that, that, that this is a dynamic that affects presidential campaigns. And, and the question is what justifies a system that produces that dynamic when we could have another system that would neutralize it in a very Madisonian way? So I, I think the uh, faithless elector problem, it's hard for me to assess how big a problem it is, in part based on the history, and also in part sort of what purpose it serves. So if we were sitting down at the drawing board today, we probably wouldn't come up with human electors. Um, that said, who are these electors? These electors typically in the states are people selected by the relevant political campaigns. You know, it's the, it's the Trump campaign or the Clinton campaign who give you the list of electors um, that they're going to put in. So in what world would enough of them defect to uh, sway the outcome? Probably a world where something else really bad has happened. You know, I'm imagining you know a president has a psychotic break sometime between election day and the day when the electors meet to vote or something. Um, it's it's hard to get a sense of you know when would party loyalists en masse abandon their candidate. Um, you know, maybe only when something else really wrong has already occurred. So it's a little hard to to see how bad the situation would be and how much we need to revise the system, you know, pass a constitutional amendment in order to forestall what seems to me a relatively low probability of that. We've been discussing the extent to which the Electoral College uh, distorts policy in favor of swing states on particular issues like energy or trade. And I'm wondering if we step back from the particulars and we look more broadly over a longer time period at uh, progressive, conservative, how much is government policy swinging in one direction or another when the presidency passes from one party to the other. Does the Electoral College incentivize presidential campaigns to be centrist and to campaign to swing states in a more centrist way and then to govern in a more centrist way? So I, I think it very well could. Um, obviously, this is an empirical question. It would depend a lot on the actual voting mechanisms and sort of the actual voting patterns. So if what happens in Pennsylvania is that there are just no centrists there, um, and there are a whole lot of you know, uber Republicans and uber Democrats and it's just a turnout question, then it wouldn't necessarily make a difference in terms of uh, centrism of the government as a whole. I don't think that's the case though. I think that you have a lot of legitimately centrist people in legitimately centrist places and that does provide some incentive to moderate. Um, that's not, you know, uh, uh, sort of absolute incentive to moderate, you know, under the fractional voting system, I think you'd also see, you know, people would still want to pick up the suburbs everywhere. There would still be um, incentives to moderate there too. But I do think the Electoral College, by requiring you to win somewhere in a place that already has a running government, does encourage moderation. It also, to some extent, encourages sort of less overweening federal control because you have to worry about, is there a state that will care a lot about this? that we would be stepping on the toes of um, by doing this. The fact that the definition of a swing state is not fixed, that you might create a new swing state by accident by doing something that's really unpopular there, um, means that you have some interest to take state interests, qua state interests, into account, as opposed to um, you know, political interests writ large. This is definitely diminished in sort of magnitude as the country has gotten more politically polarized, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should sort of poke the bear further and sort of go further down that road. I do think we're seeing a change in the dynamic of how politics happens uh, in the last 40 years uh, with this question. So in gerrymandering study, studies about gerrymandering, um, you know, there's, there's been this long concern that gerrymandered districts um, would uh, um, uh, produce exactly the same kind of dynamic. Uh, where your incentive would be to um, appeal to the base uh, and that non-gerrymandered districts uh, or districts that were swing districts would be more moderating. But in fact, because turnout is 90% of the game, it's become the case that the better strategy is to play to the base as strongly as you can to get them to turn out, even though the district on the whole looks like it's a evenly divided district. And that's because evenly divided 
is not a measure of moderation. It's a measure of just how many Republicans there are, how many Democrats there are. And I think the same thing could be happening um, at, the, uh, at the presidential level. We don't have, at least I've not seen any good data about it. Um, I do, I do wanna add one bit though about to the empirical point about whether this is a problem we should worry about, at least the faithless electors problem. We do have good reason demographically to believe that we'll have more very close presidential elections in the future than we've had in the past. Um, in the past, we had long periods where there was huge um, uh, uh, margins in the Electoral College, which made the Electoral College seem like it was a very stabilizing influence. But um, the demographic analysis suggests, the ones that have, uh, uh, Professor King at, at Harvard, for example, suggests that when you look forward, you're gonna see many more very close Electoral College elections. Um, so, you know, um, Seven, uh, I represent seven faithless, quote, quote unquote faithless electors. I think it's a bad title in, in, uh, from 2016. If there had been two in 2000, there would have been a different result. There was an argument that was being bolstered to say that those two should follow the, public, the public's will versus you know, whatever happened in the Electoral College. I don't think we can say that the chance that that argument is going to be effective um, can be measured simply by looking what's happened in the past, where there's been relatively few times when it would have mattered and when the actual entitlement to make that decision has been challenged fundamentally by many people within the academy. Another question? Sean Adler? Thank you, this has been a, a, a wonderful exchange. I'm, I'm wondering if, if either of you would uh, reflect on how your arguments are modified, augmented, or changed if uh, the number of electors uh, had continued to increase as was originally proposed uh, when with the first set of uh, proposed constitutional amendments. Would the increase in the number of electors uh, uh, exacerbate the various concerns, moderate them, have other effects on this debate that we should consider? So I think that given the nice analysis you made about the effect of whole number electors, the one thing we can say is if the number of electors went up substantially and you didn't fractionally allocate electors, then the problem that Stephen identified about the substantial benefit that small states have relative to large states because of the electors would be reduced. So you would have less of a distinct effect because of the whole number problem with electors. But from my perspective, given the fractional allocation, it doesn't matter whether there's 10 electors or 10,000 electors, it's fractionally allocated uh, based on a proportion of the total, of the top two vote getters. Um, and so um, from the perspective I'm trying to advance, it wouldn't matter, but on the existing perspective, maybe it would have given people more reason to think about an alternative to national popular, to, um, to uh, winner take all. It's important to know historically um, you know, there's been a big fight about winner take all throughout the 19th century. At first, the push was to push for district based allocation. Um, and then, when district based allocation became uh, challenged because of gerrymandering, there was a push for proportional allocation. And the proportional allocation hit exactly the problem Stephen was talking about, which is the whole number problem with proportional allocation. This has never been settled in a, you know, a constitutional sense that um, people think that it, this system makes sense and should there therefore be there forever. And I guess all I'm saying is now that we have a reason to think again about how to structure the Electoral College to um, reduce the public's sense that it is increasingly undemocratic, um, we ought to be pushing for a result that affirms a democratic character, at least the character of including a wider range of Americans in the selection of who the president should be. So I, I certainly agree that if you double the size of the house, which I think is an excellent idea, um, for other reasons, that would diminish the impact of getting two senators um, included in your electoral vote count. Um, and unfortunately, that may be one reason that we haven't doubled the size of the house, because small states don't want to lose those two, uh, those, uh, the effect of those two senators. Um, I think that the, uh, 
point that Professor Lessig makes about, about whole number electors versus fractional is absolutely right. If you're going to do proportional allocation, you really have to have a constitutional amendment to make it fractional, because otherwise everything breaks. The number of uh, apportionment paradoxes, if you're curious about this, you can go on the Wikipedia page and learn all about the, the strange things that happen when you're trying to apportion uh, small numbers of representatives. Um, would, would crop up tremendously if we were trying to do uh, promo, uh, proportional representation for states with six or seven um, electoral votes. And in particular, I think the top two problem would be very severe. So you would need to somehow figure out, are we going to give proportional votes to, to third party candidates, or are we going to demand that you only get into the top two? And either way, there's just no good solution there. Either you're very much distorting the proportional outcome uh, from a particular uh, district, or you are uh, encouraging the use of splinter parties. Um, I think that the larger the House of Representatives, the larger the number of electors, the, the less these problems are salient. You know, if every, every state had 60 electors, you wouldn't have to worry about them quite as much. Um, but uh, given the system that we have now, it very much is a problem. We have time for, yeah, Jean? I, I just wanted to ask uh, the reaction to, it, for most of the elections which we're talking about, in one sense, it didn't matter who won. And what I mean by that is obviously people felt very strongly about who won one way or the other. But in terms of uh, the countries, you know, really having somebody represent, you know, as president they really didn't want, it was so close, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it's every, these elections are decided by infinitesimally small things in various different ways. Um, so one question is, is part of the, is the concern that if you had something that turned one of these elections that was incredibly close, that everybody would suddenly feel it was totally illegitimate and you'd have <laughs> almost revolution about it? Um, or is, is in some ways, I guess I'm asking the question, is it more important that you have a system where people are comfortable with the final result even if they don't like it? Is that the major thing you're looking for? Is the major thing you're looking for being precise about, well, here, here's the way it should work, and this, is, this person got you know, three more votes or whatever, and therefore they're elected? So my own concern is the recognition that the majority of the country doesn't matter to the selection of the president is not just among us, right? The point is that this is an increasingly powerful part of the rhetoric about the failure, the quote failure of the American Republic. Because if the perception is we elect presidents not by having a vote where everybody matters, then the president who is elected under that system becomes um, uh, uh, weakened by, I think, that recognition. So I want to fight against the good argument in favor of that claim. Um, now, I, I don't think, again, I'm not pushing all the way to the other extreme, which is to say, let's abolish the federal system and let's just have national popular vote. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm trying to say, let's try to adopt, let's adapt the, um, conf the, federates, the fe federated system we've got to make it so that it achieves the objective of everybody mattering uh, in a substantial way in the selection of the president. And then the other thing I'm trying to avoid through the amendment that I'm describing is what I do think would be a deeply destabilizing reality. Now, um, you know, I think the point's a good one to ask how likely it is, but if in fact there were that kind of flip, if like in the Senate in, uh, in uh, the vice president race in 18 something, 28 or 32, I can't remember, um, uh, you had that result or you had it uh, in the modern case, I think there would be a really substantial political cost. Uh, uh, much more than Bush v. Gore. I think Bush v. Gore was tiny compared to this because Bush v. Gore relied on principles that in some sense we all agreed with, like equal protection. You might disagree about how the court deployed it, but nobody was arguing whether equal protection was a value within our system. But if we announce tomorrow that these electors are free, or in the course of a presidential election, the, pres the electors are free and they get to change their vote, I, I, I think the resistance would be huge. So I'm trying to forestall that. So to forestall that, I want to get two bites at the apple. I want to forestall that and also uh, 
create a system that more regularly assures that the person who wins is the person who wins, and he or she wins by appealing to a wide range of Americans. So I, I think for the, the question is really good. So what's the failure mode of the system? What's the worst case scenario? And I think for, for Professor Lessig, the worst case scenario is faithless electors, and to a lesser extent, the feeling of alienation from the uh, electoral process. To, to my mind, the faithless elector problem is small, and the feeling of alienation primarily rhetorical. You know, it's really hard to say who would have won the 2016 election, which party would have won if we had had a popular vote. We know what actually happened in the vote we did have. But in a world of you know, standard national, national popular votes, the primary system would probably work differently. You might have different candidates running. The candidates campaign differently. Third party voters in what we now consider safe, safe states act differently. All sorts of things are different. And it's kind of like asking you know, who would have won last year's NCAA championship if you didn't have to dribble. You know, there's just no, there's no way of assessing, of like rerunning that in, in what would be the, the completely different world of a national popular vote, or indeed, I think, even a fractional proportional voting system. So to my mind, the failure mode is not that people are alienated from the government policies they see around them, which I think most people don't even know, um, and you know, are, are, are not really um, acting on uh, in terms of uh, that sense of an alienation. The failure mode is the national recount. I think that that's the one where people would really think the election has been stolen, the winner is illegitimate, we can't trust the other side, they're engaging in all sorts of shenanigans, so we should too and you'd really have a breakdown of, of civic and political trust. And so to my mind, the, the electoral college is the first barrier against that. And then the secondary worry is uh, governments that disregard state interests in order to, to pursue more general ones, and sometimes that's a good idea, and sometimes not. And I think the electoral college, partly halfway good enough um, gets us to the consideration of the interests we would want to consider. So, you, so one really important agreement that I want to concede um, uh, I'm told I'm not supposed to concede in a debate, but here it is, a concession. Um, uh, if, in fact, we could demonstrate that this would increase substantially the risk of these kind of nightmare scenarios that uh, have been raised by the question, by uh, the audience and also by you, I, I think that would be a, a great argument against it. I, I don't think that we have the basis for making that claim right now. The second point is, you're absolutely right. We have no way to know exactly how these campaigns would be run. It's astonishing how few have tried to model it. There's a couple people, political scientists, who've done interesting work. Turns out there's a Swedish professor who is the most advanced empirical analyst of American political presidential campaigns, who's actually done the modeling under national popular vote and proportional allocation at the fractional level and under the existing system. And it's interesting how those things differ, but we don't know. But that, I think, is an argument, it's a kind of behind the veil of ignorance argument in favor, going back to your point about what is the principle we've got here. So I'm advancing a principle, and I don't know if it's going to benefit Republicans or Democrats. I really don't. But what I do believe is that if, based on this principle, we would have a system that we could actually say to people, everybody matters, and the empirical types like Kreiner and Reeves would not be able to say, we continue to have terrible farm policy, and we continue to have terrible import policy around steel because of this stupid system, um, that would make us all more confident in the political process. So I, I accept and appreciate your concession. Um, I do think people would end up fighting over the you know, seventh and eighth significant figures. Um, in, a, in, a, in a world where we had a 0.09% margin, I, I think you would find a lot of con election controversy, even in a fractional system. And I think that fundamentally the worry that people are deprived of a voice is not accurate, that people do have a voice, they have their voice in the state, and I think there's a reason in a system like ours for the states to be the ones that matter. Oh, oh I guess we have a few more questions. Okay, over here. Yes. Uh, the, I'd be interested to hear from both of you what you think would happen if we had something more like a popular election whether it's Professor Lessig's uh, proposals or some other modification, uh, of the role of swing voters versus base. And ultimately, who would, who would get sort of in this alternative universe, uh, which voters would be catered to? I mean, would it, what the difference would be, would it be more like national interest groups, which are not spatially uh, located in various places, but particular uh, types of single-issue voters, et cetera. How would it play out? I'd be interested in, 
in, uh, in your thoughts on that. Can we also take the other question and then we'll do a little lightning round. We just have a few minutes left, so you could also propose your question. Thank you all for a really good uh, conversation. My question stems from sort of it seems like an agreement that we don't have the system the framers intended, even if we're operating under their legal rules. And so I'm wondering, it, it seems like the framers intended for the Electoral College to be a mediator body, that they intended it to be a group of, of wise elected men who could filter the will of the people. So you had the popular election, which was the democratic element, the more aristocratic element, the wise electors, and then you would have the monarchical element, element of the presidency. And so you would have all three balanced there. Is there any reason to think there was virtue to the idea of electors being more independent and and giving and being you know a select people from the electorate that could help choose the president and exert their own independence? And is there any reason, any way that we could have a system more like that? And would there be any virtue in doing something like that? Um, so let me take the second question first. Um, um, so my, my, my sense, maybe I'm wrong about this, but my sense is that there's no way in hell the world would accept right now the, quote, elite of the Electoral College second guessing what the people do when they vote. I just don't think that's possible. Was it ever a good idea? I actually don't think the motivation was so much about the elite, but it was more about the practical problem of running a national election in a context where it takes months even to get information from one end to the other. And their expectation was, that you would have lots of favorite son candidates, uh, and you would have a mediating body eventually that would be the House that would for be forced to decide many of these cases because you just wouldn't be able to get to the majority candidate. But the driving force, Ed Foley's new book on this is really fantastic. The driving conception, especially after the 12th Amendment, was to drive towards a majoritarian president, one who was not a fractional 33%, but really was somebody who could be thought of to represent the majority. Um, but, but the other part about this is, um, you know, it's really important to recognize that when the 12, we, we've had two electoral colleges, the one the framers gave us and the one after the 12th Amendment. Those are very different institutions. They expected very different presidents. The first electoral college expected George Washington types. After the election of 1896, people realized there was not going to be George Washington types anymore. So then we had the really contested political party president. That's what the 12th Amendment tries to adjudicate. But what's striking about the 12th Amendment is when the 12th Amendment is debated, we have already had so-called faithless electors, or we've, had so, we've already had independent judgment by electors. And it's quite clear that they don't think that's a problem to be solved. They don't talk about it. They don't fix anything in the 12th Amendment to, to sort of address this issue. So they're still ratifying the idea that there needs to be this ultimate check or this opportunity to make that check. Um, and, and however compelling that was then, I, I still feel that we live in a time where it's hard to see that compelling now. As to your question, I think it goes back to this question whether do we really have moderates anymore or do, do we just have different mixes of people on either extreme? And, and I, don't, I genuinely don't know the answer to that question. Um, but, but I do think that we, we do have a reason to try to include a wider range even of the extremes from a wider mix of America in the choice of the president. So I would love to see the relatively extreme Republicans from California and New York compete against the relatively extreme Republicans from swing states to like drive the d direction of the Republican Party, just like I'd like to see Democrats from Texas and Kentucky arguing with Democrats from, from you know, Massachusetts or from Pennsylvania. I think that would be a more interesting representative Democratic Party than the one we've got right now. And, 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 but, but again, I think these empirical questions are really important even if un, uh, we don't have a good sense of them. Uh, I, I, I would agree with that last part. I think to, to quote the noted philosopher Yogi Berra, predictions are hard, especially about the future. Um, I honestly do not know what would happen. And um, you know, JFK in 1956, when he was in the Senate and they were arguing about this, said if we, if we adopted a different system in the Electoral College, the whole solar system of government power would be affected. There would be knock-on effects throughout the entire system. And I cannot predict for you precisely what those would be. But I think the very fact that we can't predict is a good reason to hold off. Um, you know, simple systems have simple problems, and complicated systems have complicated problems. And we don't know what the complicated problems would be or how they would surface or what other sorts of uh, measures we should take to prevent them. If you look at the 12th Amendment, they corrected a lot of things. 
But even though they separated voting for tickets with the president and the vice president, they still allowed for a president and vice president from different parties. If the uh, president election goes to the House and the VP election goes to the Senate, you could get different answers, and that would be terrible. Um, so I, I, would, I would, in general, be skeptical of our ability to plan for problems that we're not thinking of yet. And I think that's one argument to stick with an existing system, the, the devil we know. On the question about the, the sort of aristocratic um, I think as a practical matter, I agree with Professor Lessig, that there's just no support for that right now. Um, if I were, again, designing the system, you know, the convention for a long time thought that Congress would pick the president. Um, I see some advantage in having the new incoming January 3rd Congress, which was not what they were working with. They were working with the outgoing lame duck Congress, and they didn't want the president to be selected by a lame duck where they thought that people could be bribed and people could be influenced in lots of ways. I don't think it would be so terrible if the new incoming Congress picked the president. I think you might have had, you know, President Paul Ryan or President Nancy Pelosi, and I don't think that that would have been the worst thing for the republic, um, but I think that uh, right now, not you know, people like voting for the president, and so I don't think that channeling the popular element through the House of Representatives has enough of a constituency. And I am told that we are out of time, so if you could all join me in thanking our debaters.